The Tom Woods Show, episode 690. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. If you're a homeschooling parent, you're probably working too hard. Check out the Ron Paul curriculum, which is self-taught and gives your kids an education you and I would have given our right arms for. Plus, get $160 worth of free bonuses when you join through my special link, ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. The environment is our topic for today because of a new book that I've just become aware of. It's called Nature Unbound, Bureaucracy versus the Environment. This is one of these tricky questions sometimes for libertarians, so I'm glad to welcome co-author of that book, Ryan Yonk, to the show. Ryan is a research fellow at the Independent Institute. He's assistant research professor of economics and finance at Utah State University, and he is executive director of Strata Policy. Ryan, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks for having me on, Tom. It's great to visit with you. I'm always interested in topics like this because they are what we might call hard questions. These are the hard questions for people who support the market economy. It's easy enough to explain what's wrong with uh, price controls and stuff like that. But it's harder to understand how could you deal with things like species preservation and and, uh, pollution and questions like that. So I wanted to talk to you about it, and I know that in your book, Nature Unbound, you take a bit of a public choice approach. At least that's how it looks to me. So let's begin by looking at what some of the difficulties are with political solutions. This is typically overlooked because it's assumed that because we must have political solutions, there's no point in dwelling on the shortcomings because there's, they're unavoidable. Yeah, Tom, that's exactly one of, I think, one of the, the big problems in sort of the environmental questions. Because you're right, they are, they are the big questions. They're the, the ones that are incredibly difficult to figure out how to solve. And for the last 40 or 50 years, we've defaulted only to a regulatory approach. Um, and so what we do in Nature Unbound is we take a strong look at what are the public choice type implications. So markets fail sometimes, but also government fails. And we trace um, how government fails and how uh, the bureaucracy ends up actually being set against the environmental outcomes we might all want. Because uh, at the end of the day, we all want a better environment. But if the only option we have is to use a command and control response where government makes all the decisions about what everyone should want, we won't end up with something that works for most people uh, on average. And so we explore that in some detail and trace how can you actually look at these problems and figure out when does regulation work and when does it not work? And it turns out it doesn't work very well very often. All right. How about the concept of rent seeking? I, I you know, look, I, I feel like that's it's likely that that happens, and I can see cases where that would happen, where environmental concerns are really just a cover for private parties to get advantages they couldn't get otherwise. And they, they know everybody likes the environment, so if they can cover what they're doing under the veneer of the environment, they can get away with a lot of stuff. But isn't that relatively rare? Isn't that something not to be terribly concerned about? Well, it's, it's not as so. It's it's not as rare as you might think, given um, when you think about think about these things expansively. So the situation where you have somebody who wants to do some real damage or get a real pecuniary benefit to themselves, make a bunch of money by using environmental cover, those are relatively rare situations. But what's far more common uh, is red thinking of an ideological or a policy preference. Um, approach. And that's really what we've seen go on in environmental policy over the last 50 years is there are folks that have a particular vision of how they think the world should look and work. Uh, And it's not just that they think the the environment should be cleaner. It's about how uh, the economy and individuals should be organized. And one of the ways they found a place to sort of really be able to make some progress on that is an environmental policy, uh, things like the Endangered Species Act, which puts huge restrictions on uh, what individuals can do with land o- with their lands that they own uh, in order to save or attempt to save um, these sort of species. And so what they've done is they're able to rent seek for their own set of preferences using the policy, um, the policy arm of the state to say, ah, this is how I think the world should look. And we can use this regulatory approach to do it. And unfortunately, in all of that, uh, we all lose, and the environment ends up often losing as well because there are better ways 
to get to better, to get to good environmental outcomes. Let's talk about endangered species since it's come up already. There is the Endangered Species Act, which I'd like you to talk about. And of course, your book goes into these major landmark pieces of environmental legislation and gives the full story behind them rather than the cartoon version we normally get. But, but when, let me ask you uh, what might be viewed by some environmentalists as the question of a, of a Philistine, really. Why the heck should I care about species preservation in the first place? The vast majority of species that have ever existed, I've never even heard of, and have gone extinct already. Even before there was any human involvement at all, they've, they've gone extinct. Uh, I, and I think most people are thinking, oh, the cute polar bear will, will go extinct or this. Or th-. But the vast majority of, things, of, of species you're talking about are bugs nobody's ever heard of. Uh, and and they, maybe they'll say that in some way these bugs benefit human life, but I don't see that there's a whole lot of concern for human welfare in this movement, so I doubt it's that. Why should I care at all? I mean, let me just ask you that complete dumb guy question, why should I even care? Well, so um, I think there's a couple of things um, as I unpack the sort of question you're asking. I actually don't think it's the dumb guy question. I think it's actually the core question uh, anytime we talk about endangered species, because there's really there's two parts to this discussion. On the one hand, uh, you have a notion that uh, if we're purposefully or negligently taking action and it, it's impacting species negatively, we may in fact be altering the environment in ways that could harm us uh, as humans. Now, that's a very different argument than the one that's typically made by those pushing the Endangered Species Act, which is that what you're doing is you're disrupting the balance of nature and that the balance of nature, if we could just get all the human beings to be unengaged from their environment, to be separate or gone, then nature would somehow be in this harmonious Edenic state where everything just works perfectly. And in fact, this is what so much of the legislation over this last 50 years has been focused on a notion of balance of nature. Now it turns out that nature is never in balance. Nature is in a constant state of flux. Uh, and species have gone extinct, and uh, new species have emerged over the history of the, the planet Earth, all with and without human involvement. But it's this ongoing native state of flux as opposed to some sort of native state of harmony. And that tends to be where the big distinction comes, is do you view human beings as a part of their environment that's naturally going to affect it, or are they something that should be separated out quarantined from the rest of nature, and that if we could just get rid of them, somehow nature would be where it's supposed to be. All right, so what is, I think I know the numbers on how many species have actually, that were placed on the endangered species list, how many of them under federal supervision have wound up being taken off the list? Wouldn't that be the key metric we would use to judge the success of that program? Well, so there, there's a couple of problems with that because there are a few ways species can leave the endangered species list. Um, and it turns out that most of them leave the list um, not for the reason that we would view as being the positive outcome of the Endangered Species Act, which is recovery. There are now enough of them uh, that, they actually, that they're actually able to be self-perpetuating. In fact, on average, most species leave the list either because they, in fact, go extinct or because there was an error in taxonomy and they're not in fact a distinct species and so they get pulled off the list because they were an artificial creation. And so, yeah, that's the real discussion that uh, on the Endangered Species Act is, are we actually making progress? And uh, the evidence is, is not, not strong that in fact we are. In fact, we're in the middle of a, a second project that will eventually come out that uh, looks at this in detail uh, and when we we really sort of explore this, we don't see any evidence that uh, all the federal spending that has happened on endangered species actually increases the probability that a species will recover. Okay, that's more or less what I thought, but yet what it has done, it has accomplished something, which of course is to interfere with people's land use, normal land use, and to make them, it's, it's it's what one of my friends used to call anarcho tyranny, that you have major violent crime going unsolved and unfixed and, you know, running rampant. But ordinary people doing ordinary things, the government really clamps down on them. They make sure and punish them. And, of course, the effect of this would be that if I happen to see a representative of an, of an endangered species on my, uh, on my property, I see one of these creatures, well, I have every incentive to just kill the thing. 
basically, because I know that it's going to cause me endless headaches. And I, you know, maybe I might not even be able to sell the property. I can't develop the property. There'll be all kinds of restrictions placed on me. So the the net result is to make people into mortal enemies of these species. Yeah, in the West, there's actually uh, developed a, a a bit of a trite response, um, which is uh, when you find an endangered species, what a, what's the what's the best course of action for a landowner? Well, it's to shoot, shovel, and shut up. Uh, to eliminate it, give, basically bury it, and then never talk about the fact that it existed. And it does. It creates what, uh, an econ- what we as economists would call perverse incentives uh, for folks that find them. So rather than incentivizing the landowner to try to make um, the species more likely to survive, their incentive is to make it so that they're not existing and then to even take uh, preemptive action on their land to make it so that if you know that there's uh, an endangered bird that's living on some land close to you, and you know what kind of um, cover or trees or plant life that that bird likes and would attract it, you go in and you take out all of that to prevent the bird from ever getting and settling onto your property. And so it ends up uh, creating a bunch of these sort of perverse incentives where on average endangered species may end up worse off, uh, particularly once uh, someone knows that species is in the area or on their land. Uh, but there's another part of what, what you brought up uh, that, I, that I think is important, and that is uh, this notion of somehow in these environmental uh, legislations, we we manage to turn everyday people going about their ordinary lives doing what people do into some some sort of criminal element. Uh, and nowhere is that more sort of apparent uh, than than Section 404 uh, of the Clean Water Act, which deals with wetlands, where if you have a wetland or wet area on your property, you run the real risk. Uh, if you do anything to to drain that or to change it from being this this wetland, which we might call a swamp somewhere else, uh, you run the risk of running afoul of Section 404 of the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, and hundreds of developments um, have been have been have been impacted by that, uh, including uh, some around the area where we live, where uh, what had been cow pastures, um, not sort of pristine wetlands with the reeds and the wonderful bird sanctuaries that can happen there. Uh, no development can happen uh, because uh, the land is damp and therefore it gets classified as a wetland. And if you do anything to it, you run the real risk uh, of being branded a criminal. All right, let's, let's talk about some of the other items here that you have in your book. You talk about renewable energy, you talk about wilderness, clean water, clean air, and so on and so forth. Now, I know that when it comes to let's say, the libertarian world and environmentalism, there are a couple of different camps. And there'd be one, which is the radical libertarian camp that wants to figure out how can we solve these problems without any state involvement whatsoever. And then there's another, maybe like the, the free market environmentalists, who do see a role for government, and but think that the market can play a very helpful supplementary role that's being missed by policymakers. Now, do you fall into that second category? Uh, no, I fall somewhere between the two categories. So what we we don't we don't describe I I don't describe myself as being a free market environmentalist, although I share a lot of um, sort of notions about them. But I also don't necessarily reject the possibility that that some some action by government may may make it possible. What I try to consider when I think about these things is what's going on that's creating voluntary action to make the environment better. Because for me, sort of in my own view of, uh, I call myself a classical liberal, um, I'm interested in how do you get individuals together doing voluntary things to make the world a better place. And if we can figure out what these sort of arrangements um, are that look like that, then we end up in a better place. And some of what free market environmentalism does uh, allows that to happen. Um, And it ends up necessarily heavily limiting the role of the state. It's, it cannot be a regulatory approach if we're interested in voluntary action leading to these better outcomes. Well, for instance, let's take a case like the national parks. A lot of times I'll hear things like, well, the private sector could better manage the national parks, things like that. And I realize that the pure, strictly private property libertarian position on the national parks would be highly unattractive to most people, which would be let the chips fall where they may. If people want to have a national park, then somebody will provide them with a national park. But how do I know that that's what people want? And it, and it seems arbitrary to me to decide that that's what all the land should be used for. Now, I, I know that not a lot of people are going to support me on that. But what would be your response to something like that? If somebody said, if you had your way, there would be strip malls all over the national parks. 
uh, I get that question actually a lot. Um, I, uh, I work at land policy is one of the primary areas I work in. And, and my response to that is that uh, it doesn't, I don't, for, I don't preclude the possibility that there would be more development in places that are national parks. But if national parks and national monuments, which is where the argument often comes up, are truly the sort of scenic vistas that are driving people and the reason for them being protected is that I tend to believe that people's preferences lead that towards a more preservation. Now, would it look different than it does today? Probably. Because what we have today in national parks are, they're not, they're not just um, set aside. They're actually political entities. They're get, they get manufactured to be what they are in a world where they have to meet two mandates, which is preserving it unimpaired and promoting recreation. Um, and so you end up with this weird creation. But yeah, there might be more development. There might be less. Um, and then to the sort of hardcore folks on the, on the other side that say we should eliminate them all tomorrow, I look at it and say, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to this should all be, be free market, but I don't see a path of how we get there today. And I don't see a, a path forward. So if we're going to have a, a real productive policy discussion, we ought to talk about how do we make things better on the margins as well. Uh, and figure out if there's a way to prevent future things like this from getting developed where government ends up having this core central role. At, at my core, I guess I'm a pragmatist. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. I, I, I think we should, we've should we got to say something about air and water because everybody thinks of those when they think of the environment, at least n- normal people. That's their first thought is air pollution and water pollution. Yeah. And you've got chapters on the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. What are some parts of that story of the enactment of those two acts that – run counter, let's say, to what most people probably think? Well, so in both those cases, um, the sort of standard narrative around them is you have this, this, the environment, for the air is getting dirtier, the water is getting dirtier, all the way up to the point where you get to uh, the late 1960s and early 70s when you start to get major legislation in this regard. Uh, but it turns out both air and water had been getting cleaner for a long time prior, prior to that, uh, due to changes in both preference as people got wealthier, um, they were more and more focused on it, but also local uh, actions had started to change that. And so what really happens, um, so the great one in water is the, the Cuyahoga River fire, which is sort of what everybody points to. It, it, the river manages to catch on fire, and that is dramatic, and it is uh, disconcerting. But it's also, um, the reality is that the river had actually been progressively getting cleaner uh, over the decades before that, and the river had been catching fire far less often than it had in the past. Uh, that one just happened to coincide with the moment when uh, television had reached a point where you had lots of news coverage, and so you got a made-for-TV disaster. Uh, same thing happened with an oil spill off Santa Barbara, which brings it uh, right to the top of people's attention, despite the fact that on average it had all been getting better over time. Now, it didn't mean that it was perfect, but it it did mean that the trends had been moving in that direction, all without this massive central regulation. All right. Yeah. So in other words, uh, this is another example of something that I've pointed out repeatedly uh, on the show here, which is that we give either federal legislation or federal regulatory bodies a pass when it comes to questions like this, that we, we see that worker safety has improved after OSHA. But we don't bother to ask, what was the trend in worker safety before there was OSHA? Well, it was already declining. You know, so the same sort of thing here. You already have these improvements. But at the same time, it seems like it's difficult in general. I mean, some of the reasons that the that air and water pollution came down was that the state governments got involved in it. So it's still there's still a government hand in this. Mm-hmm. Is there a way to take something that's so intractable and difficult as water and air and come up with a market solution other than tradable pollution rights? Yeah, so tradable pollution rights has been where everybody sort of ended up, and they that's an interesting application. But uh, at its most basic root, there are, there are a number of ways to deal with this. Um, and, and I'm not necessarily saying that regulation can never do, can never lead to improvements in environment, but it's where we've always defaulted to without considering um, what the problems are of it. Because when you decide uh, most of clean air uh, regulation, for example, doesn't just isn't just trying to clean the environment, it's actually specifying exactly what the emitters will use to clean up their emissions. Um, so it, it's hampering not just um, all this stuff that's way outside of the regulatory state, but it's actually saying you will do this and picking 
uh, one technology over another, leading to even worse outcomes. But for uh, there, there are other possibilities for arrangements of ways to do this, one of which is the use of the common law uh, and the tort system, where if you can demonstrate that, in fact, you are harmed, um, then you have the ability to engage with it. Um, you have to have an assignment of property rights, which is complex, but you could engage and use that um, where people are responsible for their own outcomes. Now, it's air and water, so there's, there are intractable problems here. And I guess what we're really focused on in the book is how do we get individuals and policymakers to step back from their instant reflex that the answer must always be regulation to ask the question, is there another way to think about this? And I don't have all the answers for how this could happen, but my big concern is that nobody's thinking about, is there, any, is there another way other than simply this command and control centralized regulation? And if we were going to make great progress going forward, it would be more, more smart people thinking about those questions. Because if we keep betting on the same horse, we'll continue to get the same sort of outcomes. I appreciate your point that you don't absolutely exclude the possibility that regulation could yield better environmental outcomes because of course i don't deny that either but uh, it's it's like saying hey look over in norway everybody gets a free college education well if my tax rate were 70 percent i would darn well better hope i'd get something out of it so it's not like i absolutely deny that government involvement can ever yield me a benefit that's the point of government is to try to give give benefits to certain people and then and then spread the costs around it's so it's not that we're we're just pig-headedly saying government can't possibly do any good. It's that we have many, many possible – we have many goals that we want to reach in life, and the, we have to balance them somehow instead of just arbitrarily deciding that there's one goal that everybody has to share – and it and and you know we all have to hold it in common. That's that's not necessarily so. And incidentally, recently, I've now come across two people in my Facebook feed who have gone to being basically anti-civilization anarchists. So these aren't people who want to privatize the police force. I'm talking about people who who gen, who want to go back to hunter gatherer status because they say that what you Ryan are advocating is unsustainable in the long run. That civilization itself is unsustainable and we have to be prepared to go back to a primitive condition. And, and I thought I thought this was the sort of thing that right wingers just invented. I didn't actually know there were people who actually fa- and they're all they're on my Facebook wall now, so I know that there are people who favor this. What do you say to people who say your solution is more economic growth will solve this problem and will make things cleaner? They say more economic growth is just going to put more pressure on the system. Uh, yeah. So in part, I think the the response is that you have uh, when you talk to folks like this, and this is really the the root of the balance of nature um, argument, which is that uh, if you're going to separate humans from their environment, you either have to, cha- you have to prevent them from affecting everything around them, which is a return to that hunter-gatherer, although even that's a bit of a, a stretch to think that they didn't impact their environment. They clearly did. Or you have to eliminate them altogether. Uh, and it's in that root, in that base philosophy, that so much of this stuff starts to come out of. Uh, and so my response to them is, is generally that we – we're going to have to talk three or four steps back, which is what's our vision of the world and our vision of where humanity fits in it. And um, my primary question is how, how do we make individual humans better off? Uh, and that's one of the sort of assumptions of my, my own worldview. But in a larger sort of point um, about the regulatory side of it, um, I think one of the things that often happens is that we have these grand pronouncements and then we forget the second part of any decision we make, which is, what are the trade-offs and the opportunity cost of doing this and not that? And that's often, especially in environmental policy, those that want to talk only about regulation as the, as the way forward never want to talk about the trade-offs that come from doing that. What, what is it that we're having to trade off to do this approach to environmental protection as opposed to others? And uh, it's almost never really talked about in a meaningful way uh, because it's, 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 it's that axiomatic notion that somehow humans have intervened in the system, they've caused the problem, you have to get their intervention out of the system and everything goes back to normal. Well, policy is never that simple. There are always trade-offs regardless of the choices that we make. Well, the book is Nature Unbound, Bureaucracy and the Environment, and I want to 
urge people to check it out. It's at tomwoods.com slash 690. That's 690. We're going to be linking to it. Is there anything, is there a website or anything that you'd like us to include there where people can follow your work specifically, or is the book sufficient? Uh, no, actually, absolutely. If you visit uh, strata.org, uh, that's uh, S-T-R-A-T-A dot org, uh, we have a variety of these sorts of things up there. And then, of course, visit the Independent Institute's website, which has um, a ton of other folks working on these same sort of questions. And that's independent.org, if I remember that correctly. We'll have both of those links. That is correct. Okay. Well, so we'll have those both up at uh, tomwoods.com slash 690. Ryan, I appreciate your time. I hope we've whetted people's appetites enough to go check out uh, what you've done here. And uh, I appreciate the conversation. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate being on with you. All right. Before I let you go, I've got an interesting site to tell you about that a listener started, and this is a listener who is an expert on sleep, particularly children's sleep and babies' sleep. He's been a sleep coach for 15 years, and he helps you, and believe me, I have experience with this with five girls, he helps you with children, infants, who just won't sleep. You have trouble getting them on a rhythm, a pattern, a sleep pattern, and it can be really rough on the parents, and it can really wear you down. So he's a sleep coach, and he helps you get the child to sleep, and he helps you to get that pattern going, and he gives you a free video course to show you how it's done. So it's very much worth checking out. I'm sure some of the parents who are listening to this right now know exactly what I'm talking about. We've all been through it. I, we've tried everything. In a couple of cases, we tried everything, and I used to drive one of them around, and I'd be getting tired, and I look in the rearview mirror, and the child is still awake. you you got to be kidding me. So check it out at EssentiallyHealthyChild.com. I'm going to link to it as the listener episode mentioned at TomWoods.com slash 690, but again, it's EssentiallyHealthyChild.com. All right, you want to get your blog or website, free publicity. Well, before you start it, check out tomwoods.com slash publicity. I got all kinds of free goodies for you, plus a nice shout out. All right. The next episode, notice I'm not saying tomorrow. I, I can't be sure. These, these uh, episodes right now, because we're moving, are going to be a little bit sporadic, but I'm going to do my very best. The next episode, you are absolutely not going to want to miss, because we have a guy who worked closely with Bill Crystal in a major initiative to... Uh, bring about the Iraq war, who then broke with the whole thing and now is on our team. And it's going to be a great story you're not going to want to miss. So make sure and tune in for episode 691. Thanks, everybody. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.